that you can trust them. Capitalistic motives will come to harm the nation and social agenda in many ways. I think we are beginning to liberalize our mindset from that to say we can embrace capitalism, obviously with checks and balances properly, which I think is very true. Second major thing that has happened is smartphones. Nobody imagine India's transformation has more to do with the smartphone revolution than anything else. And I will take a little longer time because I was involved from the beginning commercializing this technology which was Bell Labs invented for World War II where the theory was that if you win the battle, you will win the war. So this is a local command and communication rather than some central command, distributed architecture and AT&T was allowed by the government to commercialize. So we did that early trials, cellular telephone technology. None of us anticipated that the largest users of cell phone will be countries like China and India. Outside consultants had told, her, told us that in fact the maximum potential for cell phone in America, even in the year 2000, this is 83-84 study, will be under 950,000 cell phone subscribers they were wrong by a few billion because it was never designed for the masses. But it happened. GSM became a standard. We lost the whole cell phone industry because in America, we allow private sector to fight out the standards. So we had a TDMA, CDMA, AMPS, for example. I learned all this stuff. Europeans decided a single standard, GSM. So GSM became a de facto standard. Chinese blessed it, we blessed it. Android became the licensing platform as opposed to Apple and the rest is history. Today with 4G architecture, smartphones becoming so affordable, the rural-urban divide that we have mentally is just not there. It may be there in literacy, it may be there in occupations, but when it comes to technology, it is level playing field. As Nanda Nilikande has said, the world is flat not between emerging economies and advanced countries, but between metro like Hyderabad and rest of Telangana. I think we need to appreciate how one can leverage the technology for everything to create a rural spark rather than just an urban spark. And as I mentioned in my previous presentation, which is very important, if you take a software engineer today, 10 plus 2 plus 3, he will earn about 60,000 rupees a month in Hyderabad or in Bangalore. He has to pay a paying guest rent of about 20,000 rupees. Of course, he's more modern, has a girlfriend. They have to be in the evening at a club some sort. Very expensive habits. At the end of the month, he has no cash flow. Contrast that with the crane operator in Mundra port. He's married typically, 10 plus 2, with strong vocational technical education. Today, he commands about 80,000 rupees a month has no cost of rent because he has moved, he stayed with his family, parents. The wife is married, wife has come in. She's a good homemaker, raising kids and taking care of aging parents. He has more discretionary income than the urban person. I think we have to change our views. And what, is, what does he do with his discretionary income? In the old days, we'd be putting in LIC. Remember life insurance policies, which is a remarkable organization more rural penetration in life than anywhere in the world. That's the savings mechanism. Whole life policy, as you call it, you know, right? I went for that, I remember. We, before I went, created two policies for my family. I come from a lower middle class. And I'm basically from a merchant community. I never imagined I'll be a scholar, which is the key point. There are all kinds of opportunities we can provide if you remove our stereotypes of people in general. So smartphones and social media have become absolutely change agents worldwide. Rapid aging of advanced nations, new trade regime, WTO came in, which is going to have some midlife crisis. Terrorism goes global, very important. Terrorism has gone global, which is knocking everybody's doors. Yesterday there was some event in America skirmishes are taking place. We need to watch that. And now we have new leaders. They're very different. They don't have the typical legacy of being elite. Families who run the businesses or the political dynasties in some fashion. And they think differently. 
So you see the Xi Jinping, for example, is very different than the previous, who are all elites from Shanghai in some fashion. In India we have the same thing. Somebody who was not educated at Cambridge or Oxford through political process has won the hearts of people at least, if nothing else, and got a major mandate despite all of the opposition that was coming in. So that is a major change. These are the new leaders in the world who will shape the economy very differently than the traditional ways we have th thought about economic development, social development, or whatever we think about. So here is the new triad power, which is why India is becoming so strategic for the world, not just us. Which is India, China, and United States are replacing Japan, is replaced by China, a very important one. Japan is getting marginalized. Western Europe is marginalized. European Union is in a tremendous midlife crisis. Will they survive or not as a union? Germans are trying to prop up, but they are also hedging their bets. French are the smartest. They never rely on anybody. They take care of themselves. So French are very much moving mentally in many ways out of the European Union. And of course, in England, we have the Brexit phenomenon. Three major countries, economies, are not so sure European Union is their future. So this is very key. Now, interestingly, India is becoming very strategic to both major superpowers, which is United States and China. U.S. is now desperate to have India on its side. It was opposite. We needed America, or Soviet Union under Mrs. Gandhi. Today, U.S. needs India better than ever before for its strategic interest, its own whatever they want to do. And China needs India as badly. Now we have to decide which way should we align or should we align at all. And the reason is that these new powers, China and India, are coming because largest consumer markets are in these three areas. America always was big, we know, 400 million population. But the consumer markets are going to be dominated by Chinese and the Indian consumers. We are almost number one, number two in most product categories. It's the consumer economy that drives economy. 65, 70% of all economies are driven by consumer markets, not by industrial markets or by government or military markets. It is defense, which is the second major area where India will grow and Hyderabad has the option to become actually the defense capital of India, not necessarily Bangalore. My view is that I think Bangalore is in serious trouble political instability, for example, infrastructure nightmare right now. It overgrew without proper planning and it might lose both IT services as well as defense to some other city and it's very likely to be Hyderabad. And of course, security is the major industry that's growing enormously, which are all going to drive future relationship among these nations. So let me take a few areas quickly and then come to Telangana. I have time wise, I'm okay. I worry about Venkata. When he looks at me, I want to make sure I'm okay. <laughs> okay. So the new world order, or is it a disorder, which is the main point, which I'll cut back quickly. China definitely is emerging as a super economic power, and there's nothing America can do to slow it down, except for some war. So I do a lot of theory of peace, as it is called in advising. European Union will be pacified, is pacified with the European Union. You can't go to war with yourself. Latin America, we do not see any. Middle East has sparks, but will not get out of hand where the whole world participates. If there is a spark of any kind of a major war, it is now in Asia. And usually wars are instigated by outsiders, not by insiders. There are five, six major sparks around here which is very much like a brittle land in California or Arizona. It is the tourist who comes and does a camp, innocently even. They don't know how to put out the fire, it gets out of hand. And once it gets out that fire, you know that there's nothing you can do. It has to burn its own course. And contrary to all the expectations, nuclear weapons are no longer the deterrent. Only thing we find as a deterrent is to make these three economies as much interdependent on each other in white capital, in white people, then you have a perfect hostage holding. 
If something happens to your people and assets in a foreign country significantly, your domestic politics get impacted. So we are now creating a theory of economic interdependence as opposed to nuclear weapons to have some sort of an order around here as China emerges as a really superpower and contends the superiority with the America primarily. Uh, discord among traditional allies. Have you seen discord recently since our last presidential election? Europeans are absolutely saying, what is happening to America? It's shaking up everything that we knew to work together, from the NATO alliance, in fact, to trade, to politics, everything. So this is another major area. Most important third point, and I would not go through all of them because of the time, populism will rule the world. And populism is very different than leading from a policy viewpoint. You see the change in France. Macron comes out of nowhere. You have seen the change surprisingly in Germany may happen, we think. Populism is the one that created a Brexit in the in UK. No intellectual people ever thought they would decide to get away from the European Union architecture because they were part of the architecture. And populism can be the way that makes a difference in countries like Singapore with a single party and including in China. China is so wise, has looked at its history. They always had a saying that if there is an uprising that takes place, they call it peasants. Usually rewards begin with peasant and now we have a great political leader or a social leader, activism, who becomes a politician, creates an uprising and topples the government. Whether it's a monarchy or a single party or a democracy makes no difference. So every leader in the world, no matter what form of government, now is very nervous about where the next sparks will come. So populism is everywhere. Eastern European countries are suffering from that as, the, as the, you know, the, the Arab nations are struggling with the same thing. And I think that's one we need to think about. I will not go every place, but I will also make last point around here. Capital markets are in turmoil. And my analysis says that the equity market is not the future growth, or debt market is not the future. For the next one decade, it will be private equity that will rule the world. Understand private equity. It is multi-trillion dollar of money sitting idle, and they are neither trusting the public the equity market, the stock market, nor they are trusting the debt market, surprisingly. So we are watching the private equity guys, players, including sovereign funds, and how do you motivate, attract them to invest in your economy becomes very key. So I will now take the next area, why India is destined to become a strategic globally, which means the focus is not just on our own enterprises, our own economy, but how can we leverage global economy that can come here, as Hyderabad has done a great job, as Bangalore did a great job at one time. Both China and then the U.S. consider India to be strategic in the future. India has all the ingredients but does not seem to have a recipe, which I think we are evolving now. I would not be so harsh as I'm making a statement. So what's a recipe? Recipe is the vision. But it's a vision with a mission. It is not just dreaming about the future, but having measurements and accountability and tracking properly. Vision is all about positioning for the future. That's all vision is all about. It is always aspirational. People get excited. People don't like bad news. They like to have optimism about the next generation. Vision is always proactive. Somebody takes charge about shaping the economy, the nation, the people, etc. And it is mission driven, as I mentioned. So let me just quickly tell you what are our ingredients, India's ingredients, then we'll come to Telangana in a moment. Uh, the main ingredient is the big, large consumer market. That's a huge. So India's main thing is the consumer markets, which are growing fantastically because all consumer economy was unbranded products distributed through unorganized sector now all becoming branded products distributed through organized sector. The GST is having a major transformation out of nowhere. Technology is having a major transformation out of nowhere. 
So when you talk to Flipkart of the world, they say our markets growing are not metro necessarily, but the second tier, third tier cities, almost rural that they can reach because you do have a 4G and a smartphone architecture. And you have the other platform on the other end for payment system or Paytm, which won quite a lot through demonetization. Most people had to go Paytm or the government encouraged. So it's an interesting area. What I find fascinating compared to my days is positive self-image. We believe we can do it. We don't have to be ashamed of who we are. When I travel in the 60s for machine tool industry from India for export potential in Europe, people thought, I would say, first of all, I was not welcome. I had to have a visa every place because I had an Indian passport. It's fascinating. And people would smile or won't even smile, but say, are you a diamond merchant? I'm a Guju. I look like Guju, I guess which is the association of diamond industry. Today when I travel, the bellboy who takes my luggage to my room smiles first of all. And second says, are you an IT consultant or advisor? Isn't that interesting? So world is actually embracing people of Indian origin, which is why the third major point is very important. We have a huge global diaspora, which we have not learned to leverage properly. As an organized force, to enable India in its globalization. We do have a digital talent, massive. The numbers are sheer staggering numbers. And we have a language advantage before China becomes all English-speaking nation, which they will do by policy. Ours is more a market process rather than by policy. Surprisingly, we have never leveraged our external affairs ministry properly. You have to have minister, you know, reach out every place, deep diplomatic relationships with strange bedfellows. We know Iran better than anybody. We know Russia better than anybody. We know Myanmar on the other side. Of course, we know America, France, etc., etc. So my advice to the government is that future is no longer typical Cold War mentality. Your diplomats have to be trained to be economic ambassadors.